Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna do something tonight that Side Proposition hasn't done all night, which is tell the truth. I'm gonna give you actual facts, which are completely different from the material that probably gotten from like ISIS tweets and ISIS dating sites, right? <laughs> so, first of all, I'd like to focus on the point, a point that has been made in the debates, particularly by side opposition. The fact that the media has distorted and misconstrued the image of Islam and the image of Muslims, right? For years now. I'm sure that when Islam's mentioned, the majority of people would think of bombings, and that when Muslims are mentioned, Arab males with bombs strapped to their chest comes to mind, right? Fortunately for humanity, that's not what Muslims are actually like, and that's not what Islam is actually like. First, um, first of all, I'm gonna start off with some rebuttal to side proposition, right? So like some comments were made on the fact that like over the past, over just the existence of Islam, that many killings have been made for Islam. So like just the fact, and up until 60 years ago, most of Islamic countries didn't actually exist. The Arabian Peninsula was one <coughs> unified Islamic state. So like obviously, any war that they engaged in would have counted as a war for Islam, simply because of the state existing, in, because of the entire piece of land <coughs> being its individual state, right? Um, and there seems to be this issue with like Islam not having a central theology and not having a central authoritative power. And and that's actually a good thing. There's a reason why there isn't one power that has control over your entire life. Because Islam believes that it's a religion that is that you practice privately. It's a religion that is between you and God. It's between you and Allah and what you believe in. It doesn't need involvement. You don't need to, it doesn't need involvement by other people. There's a reason why we aren't governed by actual mosques here, right? Another thing, Sharia law has been discussed a lot within this debate, right? Proposition are completely neglecting the age in which Sharia law existed, right? We Muslims refer to the age as Al-Jahliya. Al-Jahliya was an age where in the Arab world, they were, it was just completely chaotic. There was no education. There was no morals. People were, being, people were constantly killing each other. It was outrageous. Sharia law was enforced to stabilize our region. And that's why it came into existence 1400 years ago, right? Okay, so extremists make up a minute percentage of Mus the Muslim population, it's something that we have continuously said on side opposition. ISIS members are estimated to be between 50,000 and like 250,000. Even if we take that top estimate of 250,000, which probably isn't true, that's still 0.00015% of the Muslim population. And that's the largest extremist group there is. If it was actually an extremist population, all 1.6 billion of us would be engaging in that. Right? Anyway. A majority of members of extremist organizations like ISIS actually have no choice but to join them because for mere survival, for their survival, and for the survival of their families. Okay, so in 2003, there was a prison in Iraq that was taken over by US Army and the CIA called Abu Ghraib Prison. A majority of the prisoners were innocent Iraqi men who were taken as war prisoners. They were put on leashes and dragged across floors. They were literally excreted on. They were raped and tortured. So many heinous acts were committed on these men. This was obviously something that wasn't discussed enough globally because we don't bring it up anymore, but the fact of the matter is it's something that's continuously discussed in Iraq. It's something that all the Iraqi men are aware of. So put yourselves in the shoes of an everyday Iraqi citizen who is aware that this is what Westerners have done to them, have done to people they probably do know, to people who are probably members of their family. They're obviously going to reject Western ideology. They're gonna, they're gonna reject, but they also reject extremist ideology. Most of them are not extremists. But when they know that ISIS goes up to them and says, hey, you know, Abu Ghraib prison, we're not gonna let that happen to you, they're obviously gonna side with them because of protection. When they're offered protection for them and their family, they're gonna take it. They're, they're also offered salaries, something that they need because Iraq remains to be a politically unstable and economically unstable country because of trying to enforce Western democracy on people. Here on Side Proposition, they keep talking about Western de democracy and Western ideology as if it's something that the entire world needs to be practicing when the Western world needs to be Speaking of 
Islam, there's like common discussion of like, like t saying that Islam is like anti-Semitic, that it's like anti-atheist, and that it's just like that there's this narrative that comes with like hating all religions, and that's just completely false. That is not true. One of the main focuses of the Islamic religions and the teachings of the Prophet, which all Muslims are meant to be following, is the ability to coexist with other religions. One of the first passages in the Quran, one of the first chapters, sorry, in the Quran was addressed to people who didn't believe in the Prophet, and literally states, this is a translation, I don't believe in what you believe in. You don't believe what I, be in what I believe in. I have my faith and you have yours. If that is a be us being told, hey, kill other people, I don't think that's exactly what it says, guys. <laughs> also, the time when the Prophet moved to Medina was also brought up, right? When the Prophet moved to Medina, a town in which Muslims, Christians, Jewish people, ideo uh, people who believed in idolism, people who were atheists, lived together but were unable to live together, in a peaceful way, he was elected to run that uh, to run that city and continue and help breed continuous and peaceful coexisting. We we look to the prophet as our role model. We look to his teachings and how he lived his life, and that is what we are taught. We have been taught that you're gonna live with people who don't believe in what you believe in, and that's okay. You can't do anything about it. Okay, one second, sorry. Okay, so I have one more point of proposition, right? Um, on side, uh, I mean, of opposition. On side proposition, we were brought with like a very, very poorly sourced hadith. And just for people who don't know what a hadith is, a hadith is things that people said the prophet said. So a lot of them would be really poorly sourced in the sense that like it, people would just keep passing things on, and then it would efficient, if it would like ultimately get written down, right? Islam isn't bound by hadith. But hadith is rather occasionally used to support these theories. The, no, more. thank you. The Quran is the most important part of Islam because different hadiths are supported by different sects. So a poorly sourced hadith is no form of evidence at all. So on to my last point. This concept of radical Islam has only come into play for like less than two decades. And it's only been used as a, because, it's only being accepted because someone, because al they used it as an attempt to legitimize their acts, and we allowed them to legitimize their acts. We accepted that as an excuse for them killing people. Because after they did it, everyone decided, hey, that's the loophole, that's how I can get away with doing absolutely horrendous things. This religion has been around for over 1,400 years. If it was this violent, crimes of that level of atrocity would have existed far beyond and far earlier than 15 years ago. And for all these reasons, we urge you to oppose.